Hello and welcome to TV on TV. I'm State Representative Tommy Patolo. You're watching Brookline Interactive Group. Today is Thursday, January 27th. We got a great show. Uh, our guest today is State Representative Tammy Govea, who is running for Lieutenant Governor. And we're going to talk with her about uh, her vision and what she's thinking about and uh, how her campaign is going. But first, as always, the news. As Russia continues sending troops to the border with Ukraine, United States President Joe Biden has threatened sanctions and placed troops stationed in Europe on high alert. The Federal Reserve is expected to release a policy statement about interest rates very soon. The Federal Reserve is also expected to announce that the economy is at or near full employment. This comes as the stock market fluctuated earlier this week, dropping, recovering, and then dropping again. New research identified four factors that could correlate with so-called long COVID. The factors include the level of coronavirus RNA in the blood early in infection, the presence of certain antibodies, the reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus, and having type 2 diabetes. Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker delivered his last State of the Commonwealth address last night focusing on tax breaks, bipartisanship, and COVID-19 recovery. Uh, I attended, of course, and um, there was a mix of folks who are from the Baker administration and very excited about uh, his efforts, and some other folks involved in state government who um, are neither overly enthusiastic nor necessarily particularly frustrated. Um, and uh, I thought the governor, um, did a nice job talking about not just bipartisanship, but recognizing that um, we make progress through partnering with others and, and having that trust with others. And that indeed the ability to work uh, across the aisle, but just uh, within teams more generally is critical for government to be at its most effective. And that's part of his vision um, to be sure. And, um, I thought that was a um, welcome commentary. David Ortiz was elected to, to the Baseball Hall of Fame last night on his first ballot. Uh, most of us were not surprised by that, but um, the writers who are the ones who vote ultimately on the Hall of Fame ballots have surprised folks before. Um, also noteworthy, both Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds were not selected, and that was their final year of eligibility, so under current Baseball Hall of Fame admission rules, neither Barry Bonds nor Roger Clemens will become Hall of Famers. A nor'easter is expected to hit Eastern Massachusetts tomorrow night and into Saturday with temperatures in the 20s, although it is early, uh, too early to estimate snowfall. The thinking is about one to three inches of snowfall per hour for several hours. So do the multiplication. Uh, on Friday, passed, the governor signed into law a home rule petition that I filed that will allow the Brookline Housing Authority to redevelop the Colonel Floyd apartments um, sustainably. And so not only will they go from about 60 units to nearly double that, but all of the units will uh, be better at meeting both the needs of its residents and also uh, the needs of construction under a world of climate change. Today, the House is considering a bevy of voting reforms, and I'll keep you updated in the weeks to come as the decisions are made. Brookline's Silk Road Uyghur Cuisine restaurant was selected to receive a $20,000 grant and one-on-one -on -one coaching from DoorDash's Main Street Strong Accelerator. Silk Road Uyghur Cuisine is the only Uyghur restaurant in Massachusetts. That's the news, quick and easy, uh, super excited, and uh, I encourage you to stay tuned watching Brookline Interactive Group for my interview with state rep and doctor and lieutenant gubernatorial candidate, uh, Tammy Govea, uh, right after the flip. Thanks for watching and stay tuned.
And as promised, we've got an unbelievable guest this week. We've got State Representative Tammy Govea, who's running for Lieutenant Governor. Tammy, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me here. It's been such an honor serving with you, Representative Vitolo, and glad to be here uh, to talk a little bit about my campaign and share my insights with uh, your viewers. Yeah, and I can't wait to, to get into it. But folks um, in Brookline don't necessarily know the rep from Acton. So like, what have you been doing your whole life? Tell us about you, uh, where you're sure. coming from, a little bit of your background. Absolutely. So thank you. I uh, grew up in the city of Lowell. My grandfather was in the Carpenters Union. Uh, that really put my family on solid economic footing, which was really great for us. Um, it allowed my parents to buy a two family, uh, rent out the upstairs apartment to stretch wages. Um, but, you know, living in the city of Lowell, a gateway city, one of our first industrialized cities in, in the state and in the country, um, you know, really experienced a lot of uh, the flight from manufacturing or organizations going to other parts of the country and even leaving the country eventually. And, you know, that economic downturn really has impacted um, so many of our gateway cities. And I saw it as a young person growing up in the city of Lowell, just how it impacted my neighbors, my classmates, um, and even some of my extended family uh, who really struggled financially, some who didn't have heat or hot water in the winter time. And so for me, that really in instilled in me a deep sense of empathy and a desire to give back and a desire to be of service to my community. And so I've been uh, a public health social worker for the last 25 years, mostly focused on environmental health um, and climate justice, as well as on the opioid crisis. And then three years ago was elected to uh, serve in the state, state house as uh, the representative for the 14th Middlesex district, which is Acton, Concord, Carlisle and Chelmsford because I did move to the town of Acton about 13 years ago when I became a single parent, it was just a really great place for, for me to land with my family and uh, have been really proud to serve in the Mass House of Reps with uh, Representative Latolo and our whole class. So, you know, folks in Brookline are going to be shocked. Wait, you could represent more than one town? That's crazy, right? I, and, oh, I'm and so jealous of you. <laughs> one town be, would be great. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> you know, there's different challenges and different responsibilities uh, in both cases. But um, but you've been you've been in action for a while, and um, I know while uh, I don't know when you started, but I know um, you recently finished um, a graduate program. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so um, I finished my doctorate in public health in August of 2020. Uh, it was focused on my research. I focused on um, non-arrest policies for opioid use and addiction. Just realizing how our, you know, over 200 year history with drug policies in the state and in the country um, are really seeped in racism and even sexism, which a lot of people aren't aware of. And just learning that, um, I decided to focus my dissertation on uh, trying to come up with different policies to um, address the over incarceration of men of color in particular in our state. Um, and our very punitive drug laws and making sure that people have access to the treatment that they really need and that their families are so desperately clamoring for them to get. So that's why I did that research and finished that, as I said, in uh, August of 2020. And so we obviously, we've seen the way that um, our site has treated um, those who are addicted to or abusing uh, different drugs. And gee, there does seem to be um, a pretty obvious trend associated with race. Uh, with respect to opioids, uh, obviously Mass and Cass is in the news again with Mayor Wu um, working to, to resolve um, that particular location of abuse uh, and all of the challenges that come with it. You feel like um, she's going about it the right way? I do. I think they're, they're, it's a really tricky situation, right? I mean, she inherited um, a really big problem from the prior administration. And by the prior, I don't necessarily mean uh, Mayor Janey, but you know, Mayor Walsh, when he was in during his tenure with the closing of the Long Island Bridge, and then just the 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 um, impact of the increases in homelessness, the concentration of some of the services that are down around Mass and Cass. Um, I say this with a little bit of um, sort of participant observation uh, kind of experience because I 
went to the BU School of Public Health, which is right there at the intersection of Mass and Cass. And so when I started my, uh, my master's and my doctoral work, um, there weren't the encampments that we see now. And so Mayor Wu has really inherited something that's needed uh, to really address the urgent needs, get people um, into safe housing and also get people access to um, some of the other assistance that they might need, such as substance use disorder treatment, mental health treatment, um, or simply getting access to a job and just having some stabilized housing. So I think the work that she's done there is um, pretty incredible. Um, but to be honest, these encampments are all across our state and we're not talking about it that way. Um, we're really, for the most part, the focus really has been on Mass and Cass, but there are people sleeping in the woods in Falmouth. There are people who are sleeping along um, the bike trail in Northampton. Um, there are folks in the woods more than have ever been before in the city of Lowell. And so we have a real problem and it goes to the rising cost of housing, uh, the lack of, of workforce to meet the mental health and addiction treatment needs that our population has. And just of course, the impacts of um, COVID on um, job rates and childcare and just all the other uh, ripple effects of um, the pandemic and how they've really impacted our families. And, but I, I just wanna say one thing, you know, I, I decided to also focus on opioids in my dissertation um, because quite honestly, so many people, um, young people who live in suburbs and white people were being impacted. And so the conversation really has shifted again because of the racial dynamics of who's been impacted by the opioid crisis. And I think this is time for us to have a different path forward around how we uh, treat drug use, uh, how we treat possession of drugs, um, and how we treat people who need access to a whole host of uh, treatment, not just for substance use, but also mental health um, and making sure that people are treated with health uh, or treated with dignity and with respect um, as they're trying to seek um, health care and mental health care. So let's dig into that a little bit more. Obviously, there are physical health concerns associated with, with addiction and when it comes with things like homelessness, but clearly um, mental health considerations as well. And and as we're, you know, um, as we've learned through the pandemic, some of us have learned through the pandemic, some of us are like you already knew, um, you know, the public health implications uh, when um, there are communicable diseases, when there are sort of cascading or domino effects. So walk us through uh, going forward, um, given that there are encampments all across the state and certainly the country, what, what is the suite of policies um, that make significant progress uh, toward both um, helping the people who are struggling now and preventing or reducing the chance that people who aren't yet struggling fall into that um, set of behaviors and set of challenges? Yeah, that's the perfect question. So the way I like to think about a lot of these problems, um, whether you're talking about our mental health care workforce and our mental health care system, or you're talking about housing, or you're talking even about the environment and uh, climate change, that there's urgent uh, issues that we have to address right now um, because people are suffering right now. But we also need to really have an eye towards making the investments and putting in place the policies and practices that really prepare us for long-term sustainability of whatever issue it is that we are seeking to address. So for instance, when it comes to um, you know, the workforce shortage that we have in mental health system, um, and we know this because we hear of university students who only get 15 minutes with a clinician, we hear of uh, young people boarding in our emergency departments for over 100 days, um, clogging up the system, not for the, their fault, but because the um, bureaucracies that are supposed to support that child couldn't come to an agreement about who is going to pay for their child's residential treatment. And what that means is that that child was occupying a bed that could have gone to a handful of other young people who needed to come and also seek uh, you know, emergency care. And so the whole system is just really clogged up because we haven't right now in the urgent space unlocked how to get more social workers and more clinicians 
um, out there supporting and providing the care that so many people need. So one of the solutions is to increase the pay and increase the rates of reimbursement and increase the rates of um, you know, the parity that is supposed to be happening in our mental health care system with our traditional health care, physical health care system that just has not happened. And preparing for the long term is making the investments in community-based treatments systems that people really desperately need. Um, you know, people want to be able to, you know, walk down the street or take a, a bus or maybe a T or uh, take a some other mode of transportation, maybe their own car if they have a car, um, to be able to seek the treatment that they need. But what we have right now is people have to take two or three buses and a train to get access to treatment. And so we need to make the long-term investments to make sure that people in our state have access to the resources um, that they truly need. And we can replicate this kind of thinking um, regardless of what complex problem we're really uh, trying to address. So I'll give you another example, climate change. So this summer I was down in Brockton, I helped deliver air conditioners as part of a mutual aid uh, support group to people who did not have air conditioners in their housing, but their children have asthma. And so they weren't able to uh, if they close their windows in the sweltering heat, that's really incredibly dangerous from a public health perspective in terms of heat stroke, but they couldn't keep the windows open because you may recall the poor air quality we had when the fires were happening out west and the air quality and the air was just coming our way. I know people who didn't have any respiratory issues um, diagnosed that they knew of and they'd step outside and could only stay outside for a few minutes. For our asthmatic children and asthmatic fam family members, um, that's really incredibly difficult and it's a, it's a triggering event that could send them to the emergency department. So getting folks air conditioners right now is a way to address the urgent impacts of climate change that are already upon us. But of course we need to make the investments in you know 100% renewables, um, adding more solar panels. We'll hopefully be voting on, you know, some more climate legislation um, soon uh, in the House of Representatives. That's how we make some of the a little bit longer term investments, you know, investments that take a, a few years, not the things like passing out um, uh, air conditioners um, to address the urgent uh, health care needs and public health needs of our population. So let's take a step back, uh, you know, when when I introduced you, I pointed out that you're a, you're a member of the House, but you're running for lieutenant governor. And so, look, we've got some time yeah. left. Let's let's talk about that. Uh, tell us about uh, you know you made this decision. I'm gonna I'm gonna not run for re-election in the House. I'm gonna you know go go yeah. for the the corner office, so to speak. Tell us about that. Tell us about the way you're thinking about it, and and um, how how you think it's gonna play out for you. Yeah, you know, I did give up a very safe seat in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Um, I have, you know, felt honored and privileged to represent the 14th Middlesex District, um, but I'm running right now for Lieutenant Governor to put the health and well being and the dignity of our residents at the heart of the ways that we make decisions. And what I see repeated all across the Commonwealth is we have programs and policies that we've designed, but when you get down to implementation, Sometimes we make it just so incredibly difficult and bureaucratic that people just walk away and don't access the resources that they are in fact, you know, entitled to and, and really need. So for instance, SNAP benefits, um, which is really a way to support uh, families that are experiencing food insecurity. We know that 50% of families who are eligible are not receiving SNAP. And so I've been asking, well, why is that? And what I've drilled down to, and this is just anecdotal evidence, but uh, what I've drilled down to is that the application process is really cumbersome and can be really difficult for folks to fill out. And so they just give up. And so these are families that are, you know, really so close to the edge of um, perhaps being homeless because we know that homelessness and food insecurity are really interrelated. Um, and so, you know, these are really big, impactful. Um, it seems like a small thing, like it's not a big deal if this family doesn't get the SNAP benefits that they deserve, but it really truly has ripple effects for their whole family um, and could have intergenerational impacts as well. We know that you know young people need nutritious food in the morning um, in order to be able to you know show up for school ready to learn. And so it's just important that we pass policies to make it easier um, for our families to be able to access the resources they need 
But on the implementation side, on the administrative side, out of the corner office, uh, making sure that the, the access to those uh, resources is not putting up um, insurmountable barriers. And I've experienced it myself. You know, I've been a single parent for 13 years. Um, right after the 2008 uh, recession, I was laid off. Um, I experienced the unemployment uh, process and it's very cumbersome and it's very confusing about what counts, what doesn't count and how do you show up? And then here, I mean, I know you know this, Rep. Vitolo, is that, um, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, just the sheer number of unemployment cases that we were managing. And I know that the, the folks who work for unemployment do phenomenal work, but at the same time, we're making it also really difficult um, for folks to just really get their application in, know that it's all set and not have to worry about it. And now we're in the process of this whole clawback issue with people who are given too much and their unemployment benefits. And it's been really confusing for people to figure out how to uh, get, a, get a waiver for the clawbacks. And some folks are in their 60s and they've already spent the money. They've already made financial plans based on what the state told them they would be getting. So that's sort of the examples of the things that I think about and why I'm running for Lieutenant Governor is to really address some of those issues by putting the health and well-being and the dignity of people at the center. So uh, you clearly have um, both personal experience, but you know, academic, professional experience, thinking about public health and uh, the role that government plays in mm -hmm. public health. It's certainly not the only entity that influences public health for the better or for the worse, but it is a significant one. Um, what are some ways that uh, Lieutenant Governor Govea can really push those issues forward in a four-year period? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, and I've done, uh, you know, a lot of talking with folks who have served as Lieutenant Governor or some of our previous um, governors as well to understand the job from their perspective. And so what I walk away with from that is an opportunity to lead from behind the scenes um, by really facilitating and leading and bringing diverse um, stakeholders together to do collaborative problem solving. So in my first 100 days, I'm gonna form five working groups um, in conjunction with part, by partnering with the governor. Uh, the first is on um, COVID response and a just recovery. I, I do believe that we will uh, be experiencing some sort of perhaps uh, variants in the future. Um, we're not out of the pandemic yet. I think we're all realizing that it is endemic and something that we're going to continue to live with, but we need to make sure that as we navigate through it, um, that we have a just recovery. Climate change and climate justice will be the second working group. The third is around humane and affordable housing. The fourth is around mental health care. Um, and then uh, the, the fifth that I want to form is around child care, because we know that child care is really impacting our small businesses in particular and their ability to um, hire employees and get folks uh, to come work for them. And it's one of the reasons why women are still out of the workforce. It's not the only reason for sure um, why people are not flooding back into the workforce, but it is one of the things that's really important for us to unlock for our family. So those are the five working groups that I uh, intend to form. And I believe that they all touch on health and public health. Um, when I was first running for state rep, someone asked me, why are you leaving public health to go into policy and to go into politics? And I just see it as, you know, the political sphere is where I happen to do my public health practice. Um, and so I want to take that uh, to the next level in the lieutenant governor's seat so that I can really be a partner to the governor and getting the work done by rolling up my sleeves and really um, engaging in that deeper collaborative problem solving um, in administrative uh, kind of capacity. Now, I have no doubt, and I'm sure folks like you have the, the data to show it, that investing more money in public health, mental health, um, pays dividends above and beyond the investment. That is, when mm -hmm. people are healthier, uh, they, they use fewer other resources, but also they're productive. And whether or not yes. that's literally they have a job or they're helping take care of the grandkids or they're you know doing art in the community, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. But in the near term, if we are providing 
more health services, if we're paying healthcare providers more money, um, the, the upfront costs go up. And right. healthcare costs in America are you know, ostensibly the highest in the world. And mm -hmm. we see, um, you know, we were seeing double digit in, uh, increases. I think it settled down a little bit, but, but above and beyond inflation each and every year. Uh, and so if we add more costs, how do we, in a literal sense, how do we pay for it, right? What, are we, are we, are we going to have taxes pay for it? Are we going to expect everybody to pay more, but they'll be better off, so it'll work for them? How do we think through that? Well, we are already paying for it, um, quite honestly. And it's just whose pocket is it coming out of and who's foregoing care um, that they desperately need. So again, you know, hearing about, um, I have a, a friend who, uh, or a constituent really, who's a cardiac nurse, and she has patients who uh, don't come in for their cardiac rehab follow-up after a heart attack because they can't afford the $50 copay. I myself have skipped mammograms that I was supposed to have every six months because I was underinsured. So that's putting the onus on individuals and our families rather than as on the system as a whole. And if you play it out, um, you know, what the impact is if I indeed did have breast cancer and it got caught too late because I, for, I, I decided to not go and get my mammogram because I couldn't afford the extra $200 um, plus that uh, in order to get access to the, to the mammogram. So we end up paying for it if we're not investing in preventative care. Uh, but we as a society in, in the United States and in Massachusetts, we have phenomenal healthcare system um, and we are making some investments uh, in public health again, which is phenomenal because we really need that preventative care. But we also have to look at everything that we make investments in as a way to support preventative care and uh, to prolong life, to prolong health and to support healthy decision making. So I think about the housing. Um, you know, so many of our families live in housing that was built before 1978. Well, 1978 is when we banned lead from paint. Um, so we have, you know, thousands of families still all across the Commonwealth whose little ones could potentially be exposed to, to lead in their home. Or you think about the fact that not every um, resident in our state has uh, a safe learning environment. We know that some of our school buildings are incredibly old or the opportunities to, have, to engage in safe recreation uh, just does not exist in a community. Um, so the, the ripple effects of that go on and on, and we all end up actually paying for it because if people don't have a safe place to go outside and take a walk, and they therefore have a much more sedentary lifestyle, that means increased likelihood of diabetes, increased likelihood of stress, stroke, um, heart attack, and the list goes on, and those are very, expensive um, diseases or, or deaths. Um, and we know that, you know, diabetes, for instance, is incredibly expensive chronic disease. So we do pay for it somewhere. It's just, when are we going to pay for it? And how do we be more strategic about how we make those investments? Tammy, uh, wonderful for you to come on the show. Thank uh, you for having to talk me. talk about, about public health and mental health. Uh, and uh, we've got a minute left, and I know uh, some of my viewers want to learn more about you, want to learn more about your campaign. How do they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So we invite every anybody and everybody to join our historic campaign. We've never had um, a doctor of public health in the corner office and uh, elected to the corner office in the, in the country, um, never had a social worker to my knowledge or a single parent. So really excited about the history that our campaign is, is making. Um, you can find out more about my campaign at TammyGovea.com, and it's spelled T-A-M-I-G-O-U-V-E-I-A. -E it does have all the vowels, and it's .com. Thank you. Tammy, thanks again for coming on Brookline Interactive Thank you. and spending some time with us. We wish you all the success in the world and uh, look forward to seeing you in person, you and I anyway, soon. Yeah, I look forward to coming in person sometime soon as well. Thank you so much, Tommy. Be well.